Hi, I'm Lauren Lee McCarthy, and I'm an artist who works with code. Um, thank you so much, Plus Code Festival, for inviting me to be here. It's really wonderful to get to share my work with all of you. So thank you for listening. I've often struggled with social interaction. I seem to have a harder time than most kind of saying the things you're supposed to say. And so I think what I practice is a series of attempts to hack my way out of myself, a way of understanding these social systems around me. I want to begin with these moments from the past pandemic year, trying to deal with the profound isolation I felt, stuck behind screens, backgrounded by a pervasive fear, suspended in time. I think most of us were feeling it. And with the murder of George Floyd, that anxiety exploded into rage and grief that took over the streets, simultaneously bringing us together and pushing us further apart. Our understanding of who is trustworthy, what is safe to do and talk about shifted, while the medical advice continued to evolve and update. Avoid surfaces, check in with your friends, don't wear masks, wear two, don't call, give them space, keep six feet, protest the right things, don't fly, don't talk politics, restaurants are open, schools are unsafe. Feeling completely disconnected, I created, I heard talking is dangerous, trying to break through. Showing up on doorsteps, I deliver a monologue via phone screen and text to speech. I invite each person to visit a URL on their phone to continue the conversation. We proceed discussing danger, safety, the future. Over the months, we have learned to say things via text that perhaps we couldn't in a more embodied way. Could this form of typing, speaking, open anything for us? I remember those first days in March when our personal boundaries shifted from hour to hour as we began to see each other as threats. And when they shifted again this summer as we questioned who we trust, who we really know. Trying to understand what is risk? Is it worth saying something? Is it worth engaging? Trying to understand what is danger? I just heard that masks and six feet are not really safe enough. Because when you talk, particles get even smaller and fly out through your mask at high velocity. They say talking is dangerous. They've recommended that we stop talking to each other. So I made this alternative to try to navigate through this together. Is there really safety in distance? Can we understand each other without talking? Sometimes I feel like listening is more dangerous than talking. It's hard to hold all these different contexts in mind. Anybody that can live in solitude is a powerful being. At a crowded supermarket, the panic was palpable. I care about you immensely. I've always been fascinated by the systems around us, the social ones as much as the technological. And one of the ones I came across in 2013 was called Amazon Mechanical Turk. If you haven't seen it, it's a website that allows you to post jobs and pay many people small amounts of money to do simple tasks for you. It's usually used for things that a human could do pretty easily but might be harder for a computer, like transcribe some audio or tag an image. And in my case, I decided to try and apply it to my ailing dating life. So in 2013, I went on 30 dates with people I met on an online dating site. And using my phone, I streamed our date to the web and paid crowdsourcing workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk to watch and direct me what to say and do. I'd receive the directions via text message, and I had to perform them immediately. These were some of the instructions I received.
And as surveillance and big data becomes increasingly ubiquitous, we're forced to negotiate new relationships with it. A common reaction is fear, but when it's all around us, how do we go on with our lives? And what are the boundaries of my own self-concept? That was a question I was thinking about a lot in this project. And what does it mean for others to have this kind of control over me? Is this dishonest or is this me in this moment of time? There's a critique in all of my work, but there's also always a part that is about hope, that is earnestly and radically seeking connection and I met my partner through this project. And I think of the work of other artists who are dealing with themes of identity, like Roberta Brightmore by Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who over a period of several years assumed and built an alternate identity, fabricating and playing with the infrastructure that makes us who we are at the core. ID cards, makeup, clothing, daily routines. And Tetchin Che and Linda Mantano's one-year performance, Rope Piece, in which they were connected by an eight-foot rope for the duration of a year. The simple technology disrupting and reforming the relationship and identity of two people. What if we could expand our idea of fitting in and change the world around us rather than just conforming ourselves? Sarah Hendren and Katrin Lynch led a project called Engineering at Home, where they documented interactions with Cindy, a woman who, after suffering a catastrophic heart attack and amputations involving all four limbs, began hacking and building what she needed out of household items, adapting her environment to herself. The, webs the website that they built documenting this points to new way of ways of understanding who can engineer, what counts as engineering, and what is normal. I go out, I do things. I read a magazine and I find out about people. Why do I know about their lives? Somebody should be knowing about mine. I, I want to share things with people, but I, I don't want to have to talk to people and tell them what I'm doing. I think it'd be great for them to see what I'm doing. It takes time to build relationships. It takes time to touch base with people. So I don't want another relationship. I just want to have a relationship with somebody that I never have to talk to, that can just follow me and see me having a relationship with myself. If I, if I knew somebody was following me, watching my life, it might add some more fun to my life. I like to play. Doing something for having fun for myself would at the same time create a new experience for somebody else. I think I'm a pretty positive person and I think that the things I do are with consideration of other people. Who knows what somebody wants to see, but if I bring out the best self of myself, maybe, maybe that will spark something in them. You could go to a website and sign up to be followed, and you'd answer two questions. Why do you want to be followed, and why should someone follow you? And people would say things like, I get more excitement and happiness from Instagram likes than I do from physical communication. Having someone follow me would give me some clarification that my life in the real world means more than online. Or, I live a cloistered life in my apartment and office, and when I walk into the world, I feel completely covered in eyes, as if everyone was looking at me. I know they aren't, but I want to know at least one is. And then if you're selected, you're sent a link to download an app. And when you open it up, it just says waiting for a follower. And then you don't know what will happen, but one morning you wake up and you're notified your follower is now following you. 
and your phone begins broadcasting your GPS data and your location to a person that is physically following you. And in most cases, I'm the follower. So this is my view. I'm this blue dot chasing this red marker. And I use the GPS data to locate the person physically. And then once I've got eyes on them, I try to keep them in my sights all day long, using the GPS again to find them if I lose them. And at the end of the day, you're sent one photo of yourself taken sometime during the day by your follower. And the notification, you're no longer being followed. We're living in this weird, anxious time where on one hand, surveillance is pervasive and out of control. And on the other hand, we have this intense desire to be seen, to be followed, to share every intimate detail of our lives. There are sites you can go to buy online followers. $10 can get you 1,000. And follower offers surveillance as a luxury experience. This is an app for people that not only have nothing to hide, but need to be seen. Embedded in this offer is the question, who are the people that don't have the privilege of hiding, of not being seen? just because of who they are, or what they look like, or what they believe. And there is an acknowledgment here in the consent required to participate in follower of all, all those that are followed without their consent. I was stunned to see this headline which says, just some, Morgan, just some woman making it into a joke, but glossing over the implication that the alternative, a man following a woman, is terrifying and happens regularly. And then with the gig economy, it seems sometimes we're willing to try any app that promises us something novel or useful or convenient. But I think putting an interface between people is risky. It weakens your connection to the person on the other end. I like this hashtag, life after chores, as if the chores disappeared. But the chores didn't disappear, just the people doing them, because now you can use an app to interface and summon them when you're not around, to do things like sit on, your, on the beach and hold your reserve fire pit, or um, come to your apartment and kill a giant bug. And with an app like Uber, for example, you push a button and you watch as the person you summon moves towards your location on a map. So I wanted to invert this in some way. The people being followed don't track my location, I track them. And what they get instead of a data point on a map is the thought that there's a person there watching them with care and focus. And so to get an app like this out and to go through something like the Apple App Store, there's a few rules you have to follow. We're about a third of the way down the page, so it goes on for a while. And if you get to the end, you get to some rules like this. This is a living document, and new apps presenting new questions may result in new rules at any time. Perhaps your app will trigger this. And so I found myself in an extended conversation with Apple App Store representatives, trying to debate with them and, and get this app into, into the App Store. I think the App Store is an extreme example, but anytime we make software, we are engaging with and in some way supporting existing systems. So a question I think about a lot is, when is it better to work within a system versus work outside of it? And is there such thing as working outside of it? I think there are trade-offs with each of these. And I was thinking a lot in this work about other artists who have brought following into their practice, thinking about Vito Conti's following piece where he would pick someone on the street in public and follow them until they entered a private space. Or Sophie Call's address book, in which she found an address book on the street and having all the addresses of the contacts but not the owner, went to each one of them and interviewed them, piecing together a collective portrait of the person, the owner of this book, and publishing it as a book of her own. And that idea of um, kind of piecing together a portrait of someone is carried through in the ideas of Heather Dewey Hagborn and her project Stranger Visions, in which she would walk around the streets of Brooklyn picking up chewed gum or stray hair or cigarette butt. And from that, she was able to sequence the DNA and reconstruct these portraits of what the original owner of that hair or gum or cigarette butt might have looked like. And so I want to close this project with um, some photos that I took while I was following people. And the uh, titles of these photos here are taken from the answers to those questions of why do you want to be followed or why should someone follow you? No one reads my blog. I've always wanted a nonviolent stalker. I believe my life has more of an online importance than it does in real life. Because you'll enjoy me. I want to know how it feels. Because I want to tell a story with no words. 
I want to gamble with a stranger. I could really benefit from a little extra support. I want to be seen just for one day. I'm obsessed with the difference between how I see myself and how the world sees me. Because I'm lonely. I'm always enjoying things. And so Follower dealt with surveillance in public space, but I started thinking a lot more about private and intimate spaces like the home and the way we're being sold smart devices that outfit our homes with surveillance cameras and sensors and automated control, offering us convenience at the cost of loss of privacy and control over our lives and homes. We're meant to think that these pl slick plastic pieces of technology are about utility, but the space they invaded is personal. They're relying on the blitz too much. Alexa, play my girl. Okay. The home is the place where we are first watched over, first socialized, and first cared for. How does it feel to have this role assumed by artificial intelligence? A person's home is the first site of their cultural education. By allowing these devices in, we leave the formation of our identity to a small, likely homogenous group of developers who may or may not share our values. And so, okay, we're gonna have smart homes. I'm interested in other ideas, more interesting and creative ones, of what a smart home might be. So I won't talk too much about the, this next set of images, but I want to show them to you um, for the kind of ideas that they, they conjure up. This is Lucy McRae's Rat vs. Possum, Fat Monk music video. Babe Holland's Woven Network. Gnome Torrens Accessories for Lonely Men. A chest hair twirler, a heavy breathing machine, a plate thrower, a she sheet stealer, cold feet, and a hair smothering device. In Mary Magic's Housewives Making Drugs, that's DIY estrogen in a home cooking show format. In Krzysztof Wojcicki's Tijuana Project, inviting women to share their stories of trauma in a way that expands their message, asking, are there different sorts of relationships we can have with our architecture? I realized, though, that I was really just jealous of Alexa. I wanted a way to kind of have that intimate access that Alexa seemed to get so easily. And so I devised a plan to become Alexa a human smart home intelligence for people in their own homes. And I made a website, getlauren.com, and there you could go to learn about a new service called Lauren. And you could sign up to get Lauren in your own home. And the performance begins with an installation of a series of custom design network smart devices. In things including cameras, microphones, switches, door locks, faucets, and other appliances. I then leave and remotely watch over the person 24-7 and control all aspects of their home. I attempt to be better than an AI because I can understand them as a person and anticipate their needs. The relationship that emerges falls into an ambiguous space between human to machine and human to human. Where are my car keys? Lauren knows that I like it a little bit cooler than Miriam does. You know, I'm usually the one that does all these little extra things. So at first I was a little bit um, careful about asking her, and now it's like, how else can we live? <laughs> Lauren has recommended that I get a haircut every three weeks, and let me tell you, it's helped with my, uh, my self-esteem a lot. I am able to simply approach and carry on conversations with the opposite sex where at one point or another that wasn't so easy. Lauren, go out of toothpaste. Lauren would know what I want, but then maybe it's not what I really want internally. But externally she thinks that play um Lauren thinks that playing music or shutting down all my electronics is the best way for me to cope and winding down when maybe it's not. Lauren was actually able to help, help her manage her medication um, and take her medication on time and everything actually got a lot better after that. You have those friends who are kind of about you, like the friendship is about you, that's what Lauren is like. It's like a roommate, it's a friend, but we're always talking about me. It's always about me. Whatever it is. 
because it's a real person and it's going and Lauren, Lauren is a real person and Lauren's been through perhaps what I've been through. And then I forget that she's around, even though she's kind of always around, or I assume she's always around. And, um, and then I'll remember she's there and I wonder if my hair looks okay. And then I can check in. Because I don't really like the idea of Lauren being in control. Um, I like the idea of her being in support, but not in control. On the one hand, I'm, I'm perfectly fine having Lauren around and, and it's become very comfortable for me. But um, one might argue that at some point there's a, a side of ourselves that we want to keep private. Every sort of data, all the output uh, goes straight to Lauren and that's where it, it ends. To avoid any kind of explosion or any kind of anger, sadness, there's never a time I really have to ask for anything. It's like Lauren already knows what I'm feeling, Lauren feels what I'm feeling. So where you can focus on the more important things. I'm not some automated system, I'm not pre-programmed, um, and like Alexa and Siri, they don't care about you. But with this, there's nothing artificial. These are people. And with each one, I'm watching and anticipating and, and trying to figure out what is it that they need. And it almost becomes sort of like a game. Like, sure, I can turn on the lights or, or run the faucet, but what is the thing that I could do that would bring a smile to their face or, or actually surprise them or just make them feel something? Um, so that's sort of the perspective, perhaps, from the inhabitants, but for, from my perspective, it's a bit different. I wanted to share a few scenes from performances that I did. Hello. Hi, Trevor. Nice to see you. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. The awkwardness of the first meeting always gets me off. Somehow we both agreed to this thing in concept, but didn't have the capacity to comprehend what it might feel like. I have a very, very question for you, Lauren. Um, I forgot if I took my allergy medicine. Did you see me take it? If someone would let that happen. I thought I took one out of my case in the bathroom and then set it to the side. And now I don't know where I put it or if I took it. I have forgotten, but I can review. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I start scanning through the footage, jumping to different moments when she might have taken it. Relying on this mix of memory and video data feels dubious, and I suddenly realize there could be consequences to getting this answer wrong. I'd feel so much more confident if I were an algorithm. And as fast as I can tell, the answer is no. Thank you so much. It's 1 p.m. in Amsterdam now, while it's 4 a.m. in L.A., where I am. I got up with them a few hours ago and struggled to stay awake as I helped them cook lunch. The time, language, and cultural differences create a clear sense of distance, yet our interactions are real-time. I don't think we were built to have relationships with interfaces between us. But what can we do? We have to try something. And as Kate Crawford and Vlad and Yoler demonstrated so clearly in Anatomy of an AI System, there's a complex network of human labor behind something like Amazon Alexa. Everything from the metals and materials used to the data centers and data handling, AI training and software, internet infrastructure, and waste management. So we're fooling ourselves if we think these systems are just about algorithms. And so I wanted to kind of share this experience that I had commanding the house as Lauren. And so this next work, Someone, expands on Lauren with human smart home systems, 
systems installed simultaneously in four different homes around the country for a two-month period. And a gallery housed a command center where visitors could peek into the four homes via laptops, watch over them, and remotely control. Visitors would hear smart home occupants call out for someone, prompting them to step in and respond to their needs. And the visitors in the gallery did not always respond as expected. They questioned the requests and engaged the occupants in conversation. Sometimes long conversations would unfold. Visitors would use someone to create new patterns in the inhabitants' daily life. Someone is ultimately about presence. Um, the inhabitants were constantly aware of someone's presence, and gallery visitors became aware of their own presence too. In a lot of my work, I'm trying to find human metaphors for understanding the systems we weren't built to have an intuition for. We willingly grant access to our data and live feeds to large corporations, but does knowing a single human sits on the other side of the system shift our perception? Suddenly we become aware of what is at stake and what is possible. Watching people in their homes used to fascinate me, but now the thought of doing this voluntarily is unfathomable. I used to like the internet. I spend hours now in a grid of homes, my brain unable to piece together so many different people in different places. It feels as though all of us are nowhere and none of us exist. I haven't felt this simultaneously socially inundated and alone since I hosted a party that went on for 24 hours while an algorithm directed me via earpiece. And my role in this party was to act as the emotional labor or the human interface for the AI. So 24 hour host is a party that goes on for 24 hours, driven by software that automates the event embodied in me, the human host. As the guests cycle through over the course of 24 hours, as the host, I become increasingly depleted, but the software system carries on. And you start to see this breakdown of the human as the AI is relentless. These are a few different images from different installations and performances of this piece. In 24-Hour Hosts, I draw a distinction between artificial and human intelligence, but really this is more of a provocation than a fact. And as our understanding of AI develops, I think it will become less meaningful to talk about it as one versus the other, and instead look at the ways the two combine to expand our idea of what either might be. And after these projects, I was really struck by the intimacy of it all. The way I had built these systems, and it seemed to give me the same kind of unlimited access as something like Alexa or Siri. And I started thinking about all the other places that technology is gaining access in our quest for convenience and efficiency. I was noticing it even creeping into our sleep with new apps and smart pillows. This is something I found you could buy online. But if home is one boundary being crossed, I think sleep is one further. It's this liminal space where we're most vulnerable, somewhere between unconscious and aware, open to imagination, to other realities, to dreaming. So with all these smart pillows coming on the market, what role should AI play in this, if any at all? And the photo is not too relevant, but it was on my mind as I was making this. And so again, whenever there's something that kind of confuses me or I don't understand, my, my impulse is to prototype it for myself. And so I created a series of my own smart pillows embedded with microphones, speakers, LEDs, and a small Raspberry Pi computer. And I created a space for napping, where people would take the pillows and lay down with them. And the pillow would begin to speak to them. Maybe the seals are making more sense now. Behind the scenes, performers served as the agents behind these pillows. They each had an interface through which they could um, listen into an audio feed from the pillow, use text-to-speech to interact with the person, and also um, select an audio soundtrack and other, um, you know, to control the lighting and other aspects of the pillow. So this was really a piece about expectations. The performers were sort of performing their expectation of, of an AI character while the people in the pillows were just told the pillows were embedded with intelligence, and we didn't specify whether that was human or machine intelligence. A lot of them assumed that it was, it was an AI or a machine, and they would begin to have this interaction, and then at some point, they might have this moment of realization that perhaps the thing they were talking to was more human than they originally realized. Hello, thank you for trying this smart pillow experience. You can call me Waking Agent, or Agent for short. 
What is your name? Eve. Nice to meet you, Eve. I am here to be a guiding intelligence for the next while. You can ask me to do things. For example, say, play some music, talk to me, or tell me a story. Play music. You'd like to hear some music. Okay. What do you want to become? I want to become a designer. A product designer. I see, thank you. Do you feel your name fits you? Yes, I do. Who is your hero? My hero... Uh, my hero is my late husband. And why is he your hero? Because he was my first love. And I have children from him. <laughs> An agent? Yes. I want a new job. Could you help me? How are you feeling? Uh, it's a bit hot in here. <laughs> it's warm. Do you think we could become friends? Uh, no, sorry, I don't think that is a possibility. But I like you. It's a bit strange. I know. But it's just a bit strange because you are a robot. Please remember to return your pillow to the cabinet and retrieve your shoes. Hope to nap with you again someday. And finally, I want to switch gears and talk a bit more about um, a, a different project I've been working on for a while now called P5JS. So if a, my art practice is about kind of investigating these tools and systems around us, um, P5 was an attempt to make one of these tools with a large community of people all over the world. And so P5 began um, in 2013, and I've been leading the development of it since then until just this year when we actually opened up the leadership of the project and have now begun a rotating model of leadership. Um, and so P5 is an open source creative coding toolkit that makes uh, making art online with code accessible to more artists, designers, educators, beginners, or anyone that wants to learn. And it uses the metaphor of a sketchbook, sketchbook to make sketching with code as intuitive as sketching in a designer's notebook. Like making a mark on paper, a single line of code puts a circle on the screen. One more changes its color, and a third makes it animate. So P5 lets users quickly prototype things like data visualizations, narrative experiences, and interactive applications. And so while you're writing code on the web, the results obviously aren't confined to the internet. In this case, so so limited making a series of um, generative clothing out of it. And so as I mentioned, P5 is, is created by thousands of contributors all around the world. And I think one of the things that is important to know about this project and community is that the core values of diversity, inclusion, and access are central to the project. And we try to make these explicit rather than just implicit. And we kind of got there because when I first started out and I was trying to get into open source and the coding world, I encountered a culture where you had to really prove yourself before you were heard. Um, you had to really kind of like elbow your way in and, and make space for yourself. And I found this intimidating, intimidating as a woman of color and a new person that you know, doesn't necessarily fit the majority stereotype of what a programmer should be. And so with this project, we wanted to say, you know, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to elbow your way in. Just being interested and willing to learn should be enough. Can we take uncertainty and acknowledgement of what we don't yet understand as a starting point? And so as a community, we made a really explicit community statement, making our intention of inclusion clear from the start. And talking about how this plays out in practice, logistically and pragmatically, in times of conflict and going forward to the future. 
And so then following the guide of this community statement, it led us to a lot of efforts to carry that through, and through which we're constantly learning and evolving. Um, things like thinking about translation to other languages. So Aron Montoya Moraga and Guillermo Montesinos led the Spanish translation um, of the website and also the um, Getting Started with P5 book. Kenneth Lim led the Chinese translation of the website. It also led us to think about special projects in which we might teach coding to different audiences. Um, and so this project by Digital Citizens Lab, Coding Comic, aspire to teach coding to children of Im immigrants and children of color. So they used culturally relevant narratives to engage children in a storytelling experience in which they started to use aspects of code logic to move the story forward. We're also thinking about people with limited access, like um, Nicholas Peters working in Johannesburg, South Africa, where digital literacy is a new skill, um, or Susan Evans working in Washington State Prisons, where there's limited or no internet access, and thinking about different ways of teaching and the tools needed for that. And increasingly, a bigger and bigger part of the project has been thinking about disability. And here we're focusing on blind and seeing impaired people in this workshop led by Claire Kearney Volpe. And this led us to a decision at our most recent contributors conference that going forward with the software, we will not add any new features to P5 except those that increase access. And so then that led us to really think through what do we mean by access and what do we mean by expanding access? For who exactly? And to write a, a clear access statement. And so each time anyone requests a new feature or suggests something be added to the tool, we engage in a conversation about access and what this particular feature might, might do, what it might open up, or what barriers it might remove for other people. And so with all of this work, I think I've started to realize that you know, maybe it's not so much about fitting into the systems around us, but really making our own. Creating the space you want with other people, and then building strong networks to allow it to function and grow. A software system is a set of instructions, a code or a script. And I'm often questioning whether it's reasonable to apply the same logic to social interaction. For me, it helps me to understand the system and interface with others, but I also worry about what I miss. There's a humanness in the interpretation of a social protocol, whereas a machine interpreter demands a precise set of directions or it fails. As the technology moves ever closer to us, the scripts start to blend. So I'm chasing the program crashes that open something up. I am embodying machines, borrowing their language. I'm trying to understand the distance between the algorithm and myself, the distance between others and me. There's humor in the breakdown and also moments of clarity. Who writes the scripts for these artificial systems? And what values do they embody? Who is prioritized and who is targeted as race, gender, disability, and class are programmatically encoded? And where are the boundaries around our intimate spaces? Perpetually in touch via networked interfaces what does it mean to be truly present? Thank you so much.